I, I suppose I remember my father, I, I had a permanent pensionable job as a teacher, and when I threw that up in the air to go back to college to Jordanstown, University of Ulster, my mother uh, nearly had a heart attack. She couldn't understand how I was giving up a permanent pensionable job as a teacher. With my increments, my three months holidays, the whole lot. She said, "You're crazy, Shane. Uh, you don't consult. You don't consult. Did you really hand in the letter?" And and my father, uh, he was a quieter man, and I remember him saying, "Hear him out, Kitty. Hear him out. Maybe he's a better idea than you think. Hear him out. Don't be judging him." And he says, "What do you want to do?" And I, I says, "I want to go back to college." And I had just started a mortgage. We had Sorica who was uh, still crying every night and it was two, year, two years or three years on at that stage. So I remember my mother and father saying to me, my God, you're going to give up your salary, you're going to go back to college, uh, uh, you're going to leave your wife with a crying baby. Um, but my father said, so what does he want to study? That's the thing, hold on a minute. And uh, I said, psychology. And my father said, keep away from that stuff and put your mental. <laughs> he says, they walk differently and everything. I'll show you. <laughs> so I've always had a little bit of a, a, a worry about psychology. And when I started first, uh, I was nearly boasting about my new qualification. I used to say to people, I'm actually a psychologist. <laughs> and I, I discovered it at a funeral wedding that people move on quickly when they do it. If you're on a train or wherever, uh, they might even go to the toilet and not come back. You know, can shrink picking my brain there. And I, I think the mistake uh, we have made is in our obsession with uh, illness. We, we forgot about wellness. And I certainly met an awful lot of people uh, in my role as a psychologist of rehab group who should never have become unwell at all. Uh, and uh, I think there's so much we can do. Instead of always reacting to mental illness, you should be sowing the seeds of mental wellness much, much earlier than we're doing. Uh, you can't see that, which is great for business, because it leaves you wondering, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, but uh, mood watchers, if you Google mood watchers, I'd come up uh, first, okay? And we're nothing whatsoever to do with weight watchers. We're totally independent. Uh, I don't know anyone in this room, but I know there's three things we all share in common. No matter where I am, no matter whom I'm with, uh, if I was in New York, if I was in Monaghan, if, if I was in Arnhemore Island, as I have been, if I was in uh, London, it makes no difference. And the first thing is that we're all vulnerable human beings. Everybody here is emotional. We all know how to cry. We all have cried. We all know what anxiety is. We all know what worry is. Uh, even the hardest shell can crack. Even the toughest guy can tumble. I've met a lot of those in recent times. So we're all vulnerable. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Even psychiatrists and psychologists become mentally unwell too, you know. What initials you have after your name, your job title, uh, how many conservatives you own, uh, the, the money you have in the bank account, those things do not legislate for how vulnerable or unvulnerable you are. Uh, the third thing is that it's not the recession, but since the beginning of, of, of time, uh, we will all face crisis and challenge. None of us get off scot-free. Uh, and sometimes we think that, I suppose we're the world's worst case, we might even think that there's families who wouldn't know a problem if it hit them. Uh, you might even know a family in your local locality who seems to never be uh, in trouble. You know, it could be, let's say, for talks, let's say it's the McMahons, and you hear that they won the cathedral draw again this Christmas. That's 3,000 euro going to the same family two years in the trot, and you might be saying to yourself, doesn't surprise me. The McMahons win every fucking thing. <laughs> the McMahons are lovely people, but doses, real doses. Uh, four children in that house. And not, not just one of them, but all four of them did the best legal cert in the Eurogroup. All four of them, Shane, even the two lazy lumps that did no work, they also did the best legal cert. Nothing goes wrong for the McMahons. Lovely, lovely woman, Lily McMahon, but a dose. <laughs> and, uh, sometimes you just wish you could commiserate with her, just the odd time, rather than congr congratulating her the whole time. Like, you know, the latest one with her, and it does my head in, she says things to me like, uh, you know, you have to know when to buy a property, but you have to know when to sell the property. Oh, oh yeah, oh, I got rid of it all in time. I saw it coming. Well, you stung yourself. <laughs> Lovely woman, but a dose. Uh, sometimes you, you just wish that they, they might have a little bit of a problem to talk about. Like, I saw Mrs. McMahon up the ladder last week. Now, I wouldn't wish a big fall on her. <laughs> but even a small fall. So can we help you? Can, can our family help you for a change? Uh, but the reality 
really is, is the McMahons are no different than us. Uh, they have had their problems, maybe we don't know about them, maybe they are in, in going through them at the moment and are masking them. Maybe they're about to experience them. Uh, life is full of challenge and crisis. I, I already want to know what it's like to lose two wonderful parents, taken far too early from me, rock me to my foundations. Things are constantly happening to us uh, that we have no control over. And in every given day, we find ourselves in circumstances that we don't plan for. So I think that's massive. It's not to do with a recession. We've had recessions before. We've had famines before. We've had a war of independence and a bloody civil war. There'll always be things that we don't want around the place. Uh, but we underestimate our potential to cope. And the big mistake my profession made and the science of psychology made was that it tended solely to interview people who didn't cope. And it, 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 it designed wonderful interventions to help people get back on track. And that's hugely important work. And we need to do that with competency and above all, compassion. But not everybody takes the same hit. In fact, the same things do not affect people in the same way. Uh, John Milton was a, a wonderful poet, but maybe more of a psychologist than he meant to be when he said, uh, the mind is its own place. It of itself can make heaven out of hell or hell out of heaven. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I've met people, I think no one becomes unwell by fluke or accident. They always have a story to tell me. But the same things do not affect people in the same way. And often it's the meaning that we attach to life events, uh, more so than the life events themselves. And resilience is, is crucial. I think in the current climate, uh, it's the most relevant topic of all. How to keep ourselves <coughs> together how to bounce back again, and maybe we won't be going back to where we were, and maybe where we were was not the best place anyway. But I suppose getting back on top of things, uh, reaching our true potential, is never ever something that becomes irrelevant. And for, for, for people who are resilient, there are the people who intrigue me more than ever. Uh, maybe people who didn't become mentally unwell at all, uh, that maybe should have, if you knew what they'd been through. Uh, are people who've bounced back completely from mental illness, who have reclaimed their right to be here and are living a fantastic life, fulfilled and successful. When you interview those people, you, you get different things cross-culturally, but there's certain common denominators that, that, that translate through all cultures as well. Uh, and I think it's all about box and clever. I think there's a huge amount that can be gained from picking the brains of people who are resilient. Uh, we need to protect our own health. Uh, I addressed over 400 people in Cork uh, in a voluntary, a voluntary capacity who, I suppose, the common denominator <coughs> among them all there, uh, but last month, was that they were all in financial debt. They, they all owed huge money. Uh, I remember the first person I met told me they owed 2.7 million, and I thought, I'm, I might can do this gig after all, I think. <laughs> I need somebody else to give us a pep talk. Uh, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, you know, everybody was in trouble. Uh, but not everybody has to fall apart. I mean, that's the crucial bit. Um, and we underestimate our own potential to cope. First tip is rational thinking. I think when we're stressed, we don't think neutrally, we don't think in an objective way, uh, and we're not fair in ourselves. And we become know-alls. When we're stressed, we're governed by our very emotions that we're feeling, be them anger, uh, be, it, be it guilt, be it frustration, be it regret. And we, we can lock ourselves into a world where we advise ourselves, where we become know-alls. And know-allism is rampant at the moment. And if you have that, you probably are a bit of a dose. <laughs> but I have met people who know why I can't help them before I start even. Uh, and I think we're all vulnerable to that if we advise ourselves the whole time. And stress is inevitable. We, we can't change that. And, and stress is not all bad. In fact, you need stress uh, for things to happen. If you you know, if you had no stress, you'd be so laid back, you'd fall back. You'd design a 10-year business plan, and on year nine, you'd be saying, will we start this now, or whose idea was it anyway? <laughs> uh, as a former teacher, I taught students, and I wish I could have given them stress, if anything, because they could never see the exams common. So you could never get rid of stress at all. I think, I think it's prolonged stress is what's dangerous. That's a bit which I'm concerned about as a mental health professional, because Prolonged stress, untreated stress, interacts with your inner chemistry. Uh, if you took a week off to investigate disease, uh, you'd find a stress component practically in all of them. And stress interacts with your whole physiology. Uh, and prolonged stress, where you're bubbling and brewing for weeks, where you're plotting revenge for a month, 
Well, I'm ready for the meat. <laughs> oh, my grenade, it's all about when I launch. It's all about timing. Uh, I think if you're like that, I think it's unlikely that you are going to be uh, sleeping either, I suppose, uh, and you're probably very hard to live with too. And I think stress, a huge part of stress is the, the way we think. And when we're stressed, we, we think in a very biased way. Um, we, we engage with ourselves, uh, we consult with ourselves, and most of what we think never comes out. The vast majority of what we think is never spoken. And the greatest friend of depression, which is one in four at this stage with growing, growing numbers, is solitude. And you don't have to live on your own to experience depression. Uh, you detach yourself from other people, and you join the dots on your own, and you conclude without the evidence, and you make your own mind up about things without ever, without ever finding out about them. And the way we think can be very, very crucial during times of challenge. Uh, I have met people who certainly are very frightened, who don't know if they'll be opened next year. Uh, they, they don't know what's happening next. But I've also met people who are doing different things and doing things differently long ago. I've met people who are made redundant and who already have depression. And I've met people who are made redundant and have bounced back brilliantly, even in the current climate. And I suppose three questions, which are massively important, are those three. You know, is what I'm thinking helping me? And sometimes when we're under immense pressure, you know, when you, you look at the way you're thinking about things, you discover that it's very unhelpful. The leave insert is very relevant at the moment. But if you were experiencing an awful lot of pressure, as the leave inserts are at the moment, you just, you just have started in days, Let's pretend you have a daughter, Pamela, at home, and three months before the exam, she orders her mother and father into the kitchen. Mummy, Daddy, can I see you urgently, please? I have an announcement I want to make about my life. Can you come in, please? I want you to know about honours biology. Just come in, please. <laughs> Daddy, I do want the television switched off. This is, this is a state exam we're talking about here. This is my life. So she's very, very wired. And Mummy and Daddy come into the kitchen, and, uh, and I suppose do you know what she says? No, I have an announcement to make about honours biology. I want you to know three months to go, Mammy. Yes? I'm going to fail honours biology. I'm telling you now in advance. <laughs> and uh, yeah, all I wanted to achieve next year, my science degree. Remember I talked about science, Mammy? Vumus! It's gone. You know, thank God you have the room up there for me. I'll be there for the next 40 years. Uh, it's all over. Uh, and I wanted you to know, Mammy, why I want to fail honours biology. Why? Because of you. <laughs> you made me do honours biology. <laughs> yeah, oh yes, it's your fault. <laughs> and, uh, and mother and father might advise as best they can, and they might say something like, um, you know, I suppose, you know, why not, why not do ordinary level at this stage? No, you can't do that. Different textbook, different teacher. I'll just think, it's gone. It's all gone. Hope you're happy with that, mummy. And she bangs the door and goes out. Is the way she thinking anything to do with the sleeplessness? Anything to do with the record-breaking irritability? Anything to do with the appetite change? Absolutely. But when you put those three questions, uh, is what she thinking helping her with that challenge that she faces? There's actually no thought more unhelpful than that one. I'm going to fail. Uh, that's one you certainly want to get rid of if you're in business. Uh, because, you know, we all need the most powerful, most uplifting, more real, realistic, but realistic, realism wedded to reality too. But uh, that's a very unhelpful thought. Uh, the second one is what you think and fair. Is it rational? Sometimes we advise our friends, and we shouldn't be advising them at all, because we tell them what we think they want to hear, which is an awful thing to do. Uh, like if I was asked that, I'm going to say in honest biology, what do you think? I actually don't know. I couldn't conduct a conversation. I'd have to see the data. Uh, I'd have to see her last five results for starters. And she has failed honest biology three times out of the last five, so she has a history of failing that challenge. There's no problem whatsoever in seeing that. But she also has a history of passing. So if you want to be fair and rational, we have to take all the information. Plus, as a former teacher, I know that it's unusual for a teacher to allow a student to stay at honours level that's destined to fail without sending out a signal by Christmas even to cover their own tracks. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mention that, but I'm out of the business now. <laughs> and I suppose, you know, is it absolutely true? I meet an awful lot of people who believe things that are not true. Uh, don't, don't, don't think that that doesn't happen. It's very, very common. People who believe things which are crucially untrue. Uh, 
that we have a, a, a great intelligence, but we also know from world history that we also have a great tendency to be very stupid, uh, to join the dots without knowing, to develop theories that are not based on scientific evidence, uh, even to judge people without even knowing who they are. I don't like the head of her at all. <laughs> Keep away from her. Uh, and we might discover that she's a lovely person. I've met people who want to know why they're suffering from anxiety and have two or three books about, about what disease am I getting next. Uh, and I, I, think, I think in the current climate we have to be as, as, as most rational as humanly possible. And I think that's about practical advice. That's about things like today. Uh, it's about coming together. It's about, I suppose, watching out for no allism. There's, there are people who know why there's no point in trying this uh, before we've tried it. I, I think those people are not going to thrive in the current climate. I, I think we are going to have to do things that weren't done before. We're going to do as, as innovative as, as humanly possible in the current climate, and we don't want no one uh, And questions are powerful things, because questions are the stuff of therapy, and questions uh, allow for rational thinking. And you know, if the greatest friend of depression is solitude, where you only consult with yourself, you don't necessarily have to live on your own, but if the only advice you're given is yourself, uh, to yourself, I think you're leaving yourself at a huge risk. So, so I think the more people we liaise with, the more people we, whose brains we pick, uh, the more ideas on the table, the more plans, the better. Uh, and questions leave you more likely to be more rational. And too many people already have made the wrong decisions. And there was wisdom even in what our grannies used to say years ago in rural Ireland. If, if granddad died, and there was talk about you know, selling the farm, she always said we'd wait for four seasons before we make a decision on the farm. Uh, you know, panic. Uh, and, uh, there's a huge amount of panic at the moment. It's the, and it's the last thing we'd ever allow to influence us in the decisions that we make. Uh, we need to be questioners. We need to be rational thinkers. Uh, and above all, and I'll finish on this one, we need to be compassionate, because an awful lot of people are hammering themselves in the current climate. A lot of people who, I suppose, maybe did make decisions that were wrong decisions a few years back. And those people were advised by people who thought maybe that the decision was a good decision to make at the time. Uh, and, and, and I suppose it's very, very easy to hammer yourself when, you know, I should have seen it, it's me that signed it. You know, anything I do is wrong anyway. You know, my sister's different. Everything goes right for her. And, uh, you know, the big man's now. We should, we should watch them and learn from them. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, we need to be more compassionate. And, you know, you know, everybody is feeling this recession. Even those who tell you that they're not. They're just very smart. Everybody has been changed by it. And, you know, we should never, ever underestimate our own potential to hammer ourselves. And in the current climate, we need to see what we have in common with our fellow human beings, as opposed to what we don't have. And we have that vulnerability in common. Uh, we have the fact that we all will face challenge. And crucially, the most important thing we have in common is that we underestimate our own potential to cope. Uh, I think there's a huge, huge opportunity in the current climate to rise to a different level of coping. Uh, to put you know, this, this particular chapter of history behind us and to bounce back like never before. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. inspiring other people and I think that kind of psychology not only is productive in terms of you know helping the people that we're trying to help and inspire those to cope but it's actually very very good for yourself and that your brain chemistry changes when you reach out to other people through volunteering initiatives through mentoring or whatever uh, there's a whole chemical change in terms of oxytocin uh, elevates in your system even the the, the 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 front part of your brain uh, undergoes changes as well through acts of kindness and comradeship and community so i think there's a huge role to be played by people who are on top of things to inspire other people uh, 
And I'd love to see more of that happening than there is at the moment. I, I, I think there's a lot of people who are in serious trouble. Good people who've lost everything. Uh, good people who, it's very easy to look back and say, you know, well, you shouldn't have borrowed that. Or, but at the time, it made all the sense in the world. And I think there's huge, huge roles to be played by within business communities to inspire other people. And not only is that nice work to be doing, it's also very good for you from a clinical perspective. Thank you. So I, I, I study journalism at the DCU, so I always think in terms of questions, I love the power of questions. Yeah. But uh, do you think that health, you know, fit, fitness plays a key role in terms of your mental well-being? Like, do you think that, I know that if, if I know what to do in Camp David, to go for walks and talk yeah. to resolute, to conflict resolution, whatever, do you find that helps? Because you're not thinking all the time? Yeah, well, I think, I think, I think in terms of exercise, uh, the, National Clinical, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, which governs GPs in England, 11 years ago, issued guidelines to GPs. And in those guidelines, it said that if someone presents with early or mild stage depression, mm. uh, do not prescribe antidepressants first. Yeah. Uh, prescribe structured daily exercise. And for a period of eight weeks, because there was a study of 6,000 people done in this part of England, uh, the people who did present with symptoms of depression, you know, one group was a control group, one group got antidepressants for their early mild stage depression, and the third group got structured daily exercise. Those surgeries had a, an exercise coach attached to them, which ensured that it had happened. Mm. And the GPs were asked to review the patients at the end of this eight weeks to see what to do next. The third group uh, rivaled uh, the intervention of the antidepressants. So, uh, structured daily exercise uh, is well founded now as a massive, massive deterrent in terms of preventing, I suppose, mental illness, enhancing quality of life. And yes, you know, it's very easy to come home, lie on the couch, feel sorry for yourself. Uh, we often come home looking for the most stressed person of the day award. <laughs> Can I have the couch, please? <laughs> I won't be looking or anything, they don't know about it. It's just business. But uh, nearly always when we come home like that, looking for the most stressed person of the day award, uh, the person we're living with wants it on the same day. It's, it's really, really annoying, actually. Yeah? I find it very hard that you're tired and I'm tired. I find it most unusual. Uh, but, you know, if you got out of the couch and if you went for a brisk half an hour walk, uh, it's highly unlikely that you'll return to the couch. In fact, you'll have more energy in you and you'll probably go out for a couple of pints. <laughs> I think exercise is massively important. You can lie down very, very easily. And I'm really in the attempt of, I, I work at ECU myself, I lecture in it at the moment, yeah. uh, and I think the whole area of sport has already, if I was a Minister for Education, I would have uh, PE first class every morning, right through primary school, and then have uh, <laughs> PE also in, in, second, in secondary level first class, to waken people up, to help with concentration span, and to improve memory as well as, uh, as Prevent mental illness. Oh, like, I find when you were a child, you played soccer all the time, and you, you, you didn't think about these things because you were just constantly playing football. Yeah. You know, and the yeah. likes of the recession. That's true. The I, very true. I agree with you. If I wanted the game of soccer uh, on a Saturday, well, the first thing is that we only had one television, we only had two stations, and uh, we had no remote control. <laughs> we used to fight over who'd press the button next. I think it's your problem. <laughs> no, it's not actually. It's not my button. Well, we watch the news. And, and I suppose uh, I had to walk half a mile to ring a doorbell to get a game of soccer. Uh, I have a 13 year old, and if I let him, he'd play online FIFA uh, yeah. with someone he doesn't know and will never meet every night of the week. Uh, that's not social connectedness. Uh, and I think technology, fantastic advances, but. Uh, you know, you know, huge risks in them as well in terms of not really forging real connections with real people. And there's nothing better than even what this man was alluding to, uh, people coming together uh, and maybe one or two people, you know, inspiring other people to, to cope or to re... Like even the AA program for Alcoholics Anonymous, I think that the 12th step is where you, 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 you stop drinking and you're there to inspire other people to stop drinking as well. You're there to say, you know, I've been through much worse. Honest to God, you can get to where I am. Not everyone does that 12 step. But if you do, you have a 50% better rate uh, of recovery. Uh, so it's as, if, it's as if we get rewarded for that as well. We wouldn't be doing it for those reasons, but it's as if, as if we're fine-tuned for that. Exercise hugely uh, advocate. I'm a huge advocate for exercise. Yeah. Yeah. It's right on antidepressants for an awful lot of things. Any other questions? Yes. In terms of the compassion, 
Well, I think compassion, let, let's, let's be very clear, clear. Now that we have, in our obsession with illness, deficits, disadvantages, disorders, and we've done a fantastic job with that as psychologists. Over 92% of the books in any psychology section are about what's wrong with human beings, what causes, and what to do next. Uh, I'm a psychologist dedicated to health, happiness, and resilience. There's no salary for that kind of work, but I'm enjoying self employment. <laughs> There's no salary, there's no permanency, there's no uh, increments or anything like that. And if you take compassion, now that we have uh, a movement of psychologists from the positive psych psychology uh, brigade that have investigated the people who are healthy uh, and the people who crucially are happy, because there's a huge correlation between happiness and health, that, you know, if I was to put a thousand people in the room and I was to tell you, and I love this term, that they were clinically happy. <laughs> that they were diagnosed for having, I suppose, a sustainable kind of happiness. In other words, that they were happy most days, you know, they were maybe rated six times a day for the last six months, and the score for happiness is high in that room. You will find compassion in that room. You know, even the, the Buddhist monks <coughs> from the tradition, you know, the, the, the meditation tradition that we now have translated into mindfulness, but they, you know, the part of our brain associated with happiness at the front, which is associated with positive emotion, was described in studies as clinically enlarged in Buddhist monks. And they are very compassionate people. Uh, and I suppose you start with yourself, uh, because an awful lot of us have habits of being very, showing ourselves very little love, uh, finding out all that's wrong about ourselves and talking mostly about that. And most of us have come through a schooling system, which I suppose focus on our deficits. Uh, you know, if a psychologist visits a school, it's to find out what's wrong in the child and to type up a report about it. There's been very little compassion in terms of deliberately acquiring your strengths and what you're brilliant at. And, and I suppose acknowledging the fact that you are a vulnerable human being like everybody else. Even the biggest guys fall down. Uh, we're not all here forever. And that we're entitled to the best possible life uh, is, a, is an act of compassion to acknowledge that. Within the workplace, um, you know, we can't be Mother Teresa's, um, we don't work for free, it, it, we have to make a dollar, but I think there's lots of research which shows that the compassionate employer, the, the person who sees the people uh, as well as what they do, uh, that kind of compassion does play huge, huge dividends in terms of productivity. Uh, even with the, within the health sector, you know, my mother was dying of, of pancreatic cancer for eight probably eight months and I was in and out of St. Vincent's Hospital on a regular basis but there were nurses on that ward in Cedar Ward in St. Vincent's who were oozing of compassion they were showing it towards me uh, they were concerned about me as well as my mother uh, they were getting me a cup of tea you know, I didn't know you were here, I thought you were a cup of tea no, don't worry, do you want a rich tea or a Lincoln? <laughs> so I hope the Lincoln is fatter and, uh, there, there were, those, those nurses, I remember a nurse uh, offered me the room at the end, she says, you do a lot of driving, she says, uh, we're in Limerick, my God, there's a place here, if you want to sleep there, you can, and you'd be, be up at six in the morning, that's the only thing, she said, it's an on sweet room, very compassionate people. You got to know their names. There were other nurses on the ward which were not just as compassionate. <laughs> you got to know their names as well. So we don't give tea. We don't give tea. We don't give tea to the patients. Well, I actually got tea. You got tea from a member of staff. Yeah. Did you get her name? <laughs> Sorry, I don't remember her name. She's probably there. <laughs> you have to be loyal, don't you? But I suppose what I'm saying within that healthcare sector, but it translates into business is that I know which nurses are happiest in the work that they do, uh, and I know which strength is crucial for the caring profession. I know which nurses' days end sooner than other nurses. Uh, I'm not saying that there are less or better people, but I'm saying that compassion is massive. And certainly even from my own experience, the, the people that employed me who showed an interest and compassion for me uh, got more loyalty from me as well. I'd never allowed them to criticise his son, Leave him alone. He's actually very, he's actually, I can't go into it now, but I, he's been exceptionally understanding <coughs> to me and the circumstances I'm in. And I think we need a bit of compassion in all work settings. We need it in our communities as well. We need to reach out to other people in the times we're in. Uh, and we need to, I suppose, 
instilling new confidence that's very, very low at the moment. Any other questions? Hi Shane, I'm Roshan Hughes. I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on um, intuition versus logic when it comes to decision making. I'm asking because I took a decision about a year and a half ago and it was very intuitive, um, totally illogical, but, and it's been a bit hard since then, but it's paying off. Yeah. Uh, well, good feeling, and I suppose doing what you feel is right is admirable. I'm very good at that. But <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the business side, I probably wouldn't be as good as I'd like to be. Um, you know, I, I've been very successful. I mean, in a very humble, humble sense, I've been, I've been everywhere with what I do. Uh, every country in Ireland, I've been abroad with it, um, and I love what I'm doing. Uh, but there could be people in this room who'd sit down with me and say, you should be much wealthier. Oh, Jesus, that's all you have. <laughs> and, uh, no, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that you need a business acumen as well, which is a strength which not everybody has. There's people in this room who do have it. Uh, and I suppose I've acquired more of that in recent years, thank God, and I'm in a different place, but I didn't have it at the time I made the decision. And I think the mistake I made when I look back at my career since I left I suppose mental illness to go into mental wellness and resilience and the likes and happiness was I didn't have, uh, if I didn't have the business acumen, I should have consulted people who did have it. Given uh, that I was doing the whole of Ireland on my own for a long, long time, uh, and I, I went off hotels. <laughs> so my family wants to know why we never go to a hotel anymore. <laughs> and it's because uh, I'm, I'm too hard to please. I went around too many hotels. And I, I probably could have had a team with me, uh, I could have worked in partnership with other people. Uh, and I think intuition certainly I acted on and it has brought me on a wonderful journey personally and professionally but the acumen and that you know, it, oh, crucial, very very important. My father had that in huge degrees, my mother didn't mm -hmm. uh, and my, I suppose my father I suppose was passed away before I made some of those decisions as well but I always miss his I suppose, wisdom, he didn't have a formal education but sometimes you get that acumen that's not true schooling at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you need the two, I think, to, to really have a bounce in your step. And if you don't have that business acumen, you need to work with people who do have it. You know? Yes? Thank you so much for closing on that slide. Because uh, this would be the nature of my work, witnessing wellness, this idea of a 12th step. Yeah. We need, for every negative message, we get three positive messages to counter it. And what we do culturally, isn't even offer the easiest message. Oh, isn't it a great day? Could be our whole summer. You know, we, we immediately go to the negative. So if we could just watch our language, because that's where we're going to be next. So I, I really appreciate you mentioning the 12th step, but also the wisdom in all of them. And, and it doesn't seem to be part of the culture. How do we, how do we begin to take what's right about village life, about what we do so well in terms of taking care of each other and providing for et cetera, et cetera. How do, how do we take that and teach ourselves? Things are really good. Yeah, I totally agree with all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that are my sentiments. That's, that's the work I, I, am, I call myself in. That's why I love that kind of work. Very, very important work. Particularly in schools, sow the seeds of that in, in schools. Huge. Huge potential in terms of reducing uh, mental illness and enhancing happiness, which is even a more interesting conversation than mental illness all the time. Uh, Shane, thank you so, so much. No the, the smell of pizza has walked up the stairs. You have no compassion for me whatsoever if I don't finish you downstairs. I